Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church and our inclusive family of faith. We also want to welcome those joining us on YouTube. of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us. Amen. The New Testament reading is Hebrews 5, 1 through 10. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was the son of God, he learned obedience through what he suffered and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord.
Our gospel reading this morning is taken from the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 35 to 45. Let's hear the word of the Lord. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so much among you, but whoever wishes to be slave, whoever wishes to become great among you, must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We are called to serve Jesus modeled servant leadership. So here we find the disciples traveling with Jesus. And as they were on their, they were on their way to Jerusalem, the disciples posed a question. John and James posed the question to Jesus. They noticed how Jesus healed the blind man whose sight was restored previously. And this man saw everything clearly. During the journey, Jesus' disciples seemed unable to see anything clearly. After the first prediction, Peter rebuked him when he talked about his death. Peter rebuked Jesus about that, only to be rebuked in return. And Jesus proceeded to teach the crowd and the disciples. He says, whoever wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. After the second prediction of his death when he gets to Jerusalem, he talks to them again that if any man wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So between the second and the third predictions of his forthcoming death, Jesus tells the disciples, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. So now Jesus predicts his death a third time, saying, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and would deliver him to the Gentiles. So what Jesus was walking into was not something that the disciples could comprehend. They were looking at a leader who is coming to take over, and they were seeking. James and John started looking for position where they will be in this new kingdom that Jesus Christ is supposedly to bring into place. However, the disciples consistently failed 
to comprehend the passion that was ahead of him and the predictions that Jesus made to them. Jesus is so different from the expected Messiah that they just don't get it. To comprehend that he is going to die in Jerusalem was not anything that they were thinking about, even though Jesus kept hinting at what was coming up. It is as if their spiritual eyes have been focused on one place so long that now that the Messiah appears in their midst, they cannot refocus their eyes to see him clearly. Following this story of James and John, Jesus will heal another blind man who regained his sight and followed him on the way. The stories of blind men who regained their vision serve as bookends around the stories of the disciples who cannot see. It is as though the healing of the blind man was supposed to have given them an indication, some clarity of vision about what is upcoming. While all 12 disciples fail to see, Mark singles out Peter, James, and John. These three are the inner circle for this special notice. What do you want me to do for you? This is the same question that Jesus will ask blind Bartimaeus later in the chapter. Bartimaeus will respond by asking Jesus to restore his sight, which Jesus will do. Bartimaeus will then follow Jesus on the way. So as noted, Bartimaeus restored, his eyes restored, or his vision restored, contrast dramatically with the unseen eyes of the disciples who have been following all along. Grant to us that we may sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in your glory. Keep in mind that Jesus has just told the disciples that he is going to Jerusalem to die. The disciples will later come to understand Jesus' glory as showing, as having to do with his passion. Grant us that we may sit. In that time and place, People usually reclined on their couches around a low table to eat at banquets. Jesus was good at those table feasts. When James and John request to sit at the right hand and the left in his glory, they are imagining Jesus as a king sitting at a table with his chief advisors at his right and left hand. We find it hard to imagine how James and John could be so dense on, on caring, so uncaring, the request is wrong because they are asking Jesus to fit into their plans rather than trying to see how they might fit into the plans of Jesus. Many times we try to get God to fit into our plans. We try to get God to do it our way rather than seeing it the way that God sees it, or allowing ourselves, yielding ourselves to his leading and direction. James and John have not only failed to hear Jesus' prediction of his upcoming death, but they regard this journey to Jerusalem as a messianic march on the city to restore its former Davidic glory so that Jesus might assume the Davidic throne. That was their perception. It would be difficult for us to understand how James and John could fail to hear Jesus' clear prediction of his passion. Except that we see Christians today hearing what they want to hear instead of listening to Jesus' words about cross-bearing or about serving their communities and serving one another. Many times we want to fit God into our agenda when we must fit ourselves into the agenda of God. When we must yield ourselves in, unto his leading and his guidance. If we examine our prayers, we will find much 
that parallels the request of these two brothers. Is the emphasis of our prayers adoration and praise of God, thanksgiving to God, confession of our sins? For most of us, prayers consist primarily of asking the Lord, give me this, give me that. Our prayers are not so different from the request of James and John. There is a lesson that we must learn from James and John today. That we should put ourselves in the hands of God. Rather than try to fit God into our plans. He asked them, are you able to carry this cup? Are you able to drink from the cup that I drink? They said, we are. You see, ironically, the men who will occupy the positions at Jesus' right hand and his left hand will be two thieves at Golgotha. Think about that for a moment. Whoever wants to become great, he says to them, must first learn to serve, must be a servant. That is not the normal order of the world. Leaders lord it over their subjects and those they are called to lead. But great leadership, biblical leadership, calls us to service. Calls us to serve one another. There are two relationships that are very important in the Christian's life. Our vertical relationship with God. But that vertical relationship must then translate to how we relate one with another. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind with all your might and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said these two commandments are the same, which means as passionate as we are in our relationship with God, so passionate should we be in how we relate with one another and serving one another. All of us are called to serve in the house of God. All of us are called to serve our fellow man. All of us are called to serve our communities. Serving and servanthood is something that is the DNA of Jesus Christ himself. He served. On the night before he was betrayed, when he had supper with the disciples, he took a towel and and a bucket of water and began to wash their feet to model for them service. That as much as I am modeling this for you, I want you to go out and do that for each other. So as usual, Jesus turns our world upside down as he introduces rules of the road for the kingdom of God. Kingdom rules are altogether different from the rules of this world. Just the opposite, in fact. Those who live by the rules of this world, honor, power, even though powerful rulers are often selfish, greedy, tyrants, who treat their subjects badly. But in the church, we are called to serve. We are called to service. Where do you find opportunities to serve God? As I walk in the church today, I see people doing so many different things, serving the Lord. When I walk in here, I had people who took me to the office. They were willing to do what needed to be done to make sure this service is functioning. I know there are so many different moving parts of a great service. But a lot of this happens behind the scenes with all of you serving one another your outreach to your community, even in your own homes, your families, how you serve each other. We are called to serve. What are some opportunities you have this week to serve one another? There are two ways we serve. We are serving our God in worship, in praise, in our personal devotions with Him. But all that should lead out to serving one another. 
the stronger our relationship is with God, the stronger our service will be. Today, we are called to serve. To serve the one who is our Lord and the one who also models service for us. Let us not be like James and John, seeking power, seeking recognition, seeking a, a position on some committee or be the chair of the committee. Let's look for opportunities to serve. I don't believe in titles. Let's all just be children of God, serving one another. Where do you find opportunity to serve today? Who are you called to serve? How are you serving one another? That is my challenge for us today. And that is the message. We are called to serve. Find your place in the kingdom of God. Find where you serve God best. And let this vertical relationship we have with God flow out into our community. Flow out into our homes. Flow out into wherever we go and wherever we find ourselves. Praise God. My friends, we go out of this place to serve those that come in our way. We go out of this place today to serve the world. That what we have received from God, we will pass on. Go forth this day knowing that Jehovah God is on your side. Go forth this day knowing that the Most High One watches over you and protects you. Safety is not in anything else other than in God. He is our sovereign God and our protection. David said if we abide under his shadow, we are safe. Let us go forth rejoicing as we serve him and serve one another. God bless you.